So, Doc, people listen to us for nonsense, and we give it to them in spades. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Some would even say, on our best days, malarkey. Braves, defending champs. Boy, it sure would be a shame if there was no season next year and we were just still the defending champs. Also, this guy that got hit, how old is he? Uh, 46. What a loser, just sissy man. You just got punched in the face by a 90-year-old man? Come on, dude. I'll bet Doc is like the Sinbad of Ames, Iowa. Because people, people... I didn't realize. I thought it was just a doc thing with the corn jokes. Iowa people love corn jokes. Well, you know what they say, knee high by July, baby. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that's killing in the Midwest right now. I'm sure when that hits their ears, they're like, that doc, he gets us. Doc, what do I love more than anything? That's right, an angry football team. I prefer to think of Warsaw as like a battle of who's the best saw, right? So you have like a sawzall, you have a skill saw, you have a hacksaw, handsaw. It's just a battle of saws to the death. Welcome to the Spaghetti Junction Boys podcast coming to you from the Cut Bet Studios in beautiful Atlanta, Georgia. As always, I'm your host, William X. Hildebrand, and I am joined by the one, the only, and thank God for a lot of this planet, the only Doc Jacobson. Uh, Before we get things started here, we wanna thank our friends over at Cut. I'm sure you have the same problems as we do that's hard to keep up with all the different bets you've made against your friends. Who's paid, who hasn't, what were the terms, on and on. We came across this cool new app called Cut that formalized that whole process so that you don't have to check the notes on your phone or scroll endlessly through your group chat. It's essentially a better version of Venmo, but for betting, with interactive features that make it more social. It tracks all your bets, allows you to create your own lines, sees your record against your friends, and perhaps most importantly, ensures that you're paid when you win. Go check them out at cut.com or on Instagram or Twitter, at cutbet, that's cut, K-U-T-T. So Doc, we've been looking around at baseball, binding time, sifting through absolutely zero national coverage outside of MLB <laughs> Network and Jeff Passan. And yet today it dominated the sports news cycle because the five o'clock deadline that was extended from yesterday's uh, deadline came and went in the first two series of the year are now canceled. What are your thoughts? Uh, I've always been a, a proponent that they should – take away some regular season games. I think there's too many games. I think the sport loses a lot of luster. You, the dog days of summer, you know, just where the games just don't matter day in, day out. Why are you playing this much? It's a money grab for the owners. You know, it's nice that baseball's on every day, but for four or five months, baseball being on every day, don't need that. Yeah, but there's – there's Take a two- month out. This is just proof starting in May. And just starting later, like I don't understand why we can't just do that. Yeah, well, it's it's very simple why you can't do that. It's money. You have yeah. money in TV. You have money in people going to the ballpark. You have money in the villages that are being built up around all these ballparks that rely on eighty-one home games and for the TV and some of the sports bars and so forth in the areas around 81 road games as well. And because you've had 162 games for years, of course, you have a lot of the baseball purists saying, hey, so-and-so did this in 162 games. You want it to hold up against 162 games moving forward. Even though we've seen the NFL keep moving the goalposts, I'm sorry to do that, but keep moving the goalposts in the amount of games per year. Um, but something that's really interesting to me is seeing how the public is viewing this. Because forever, for some reason, people sided with owners, which I don't know, I guess it's because you try to see who's most like you. And I guess a lot of folks said, oh, you know, if I really nail things, if I get that promotion I've been working for, maybe I could be a billionaire who owns a sports franchise, even though that's more unrealistic than you being a professional baseball player. 
And so people have just sided with the owners when really it's the billionaires versus the millionaires here. And if you look at it, it they're, they're throwing a lot of the minor league guys who are lower level dudes, just throwing them out the window. None of this is about them. Some of it, and it's, it's weird to see the negotiations because of a lot of it centers around those middle guys and those guys who are in their late twenties, early thirties and up, as opposed to the high end guys. Of course, when you get into the luxury tax threshold and so forth, it does affect your Bryce Harper's Fernando Tatis juniors and so forth. But some of the things that they're bargaining with players, just to fix the younger guys who aren't the guys who are in those meetings in Jupiter, which is why there's one of the many reasons why there's such an enormous disconnect. Um, by the way, one of the things I find really fascinating, I had MLB Network on all day on mute. And with everything that's going on in the Ukraine right now, where if you watch the news, you'll see a reporter live from the Ukraine who has uh, who has bombs going overhead and, and sees the military operations going on. And meanwhile, we see the guys live from Jupiter, Florida. It's just someone like, oh, that's my that's my Nana in the background. She always goes on her morning walks around this time. And so very interesting to see the live on site differences between MLP Network and CNN right now. Um, yeah, you've got bobs overhead and people holding Kalashnikovs, and then you got Rob Manfred's dumbass just doing golf swings in day in pure public. I don't know if you saw that New York Post uh, article today. It's just him you know, all lined up, just practicing his golf swing, getting ready to waste some more time. Yeah, and Ma- Manfred, it's he's the polar opposite of Adam Silver. Adam Silver yeah. always seems to make the right move. He always seems to understand where the money goes, understand where social and financial evolutions are coming from. Meanwhile, Rob Manfred, Mike Trout can walk into a ton of places around the country and no one will know who he is. Meanwhile, people will recognize Patrick Beverly about as much as they'll recognize Mike Trout nationally, and that's an issue. Uh, That's one of the many issues that Rob Manfred has to sort out. And Another thing that I noticed while watching MLB Network, which has got to be really scary for baseball, is every single commercial break, there was a Medicare commercial. Now, I know not everyone loves ad people and marketing people, but they're smart enough to know we're going to hit where our demographics are. And if they're thinking, oh, we need to really do all of our annual spend on MLB Network, MLB has got a bit of a problem because as much NBA as I watch and as much NFL as I watch, I don't think I've come across a single Medicare commercial. No, they're, you know, they're just moonlighting, you know, early bird specials, get in and get your deals. People golden corrals going off. It's, it's sad. I, I, how do you market to the younger age? I just don't – I don't know. You see them do it in football with the Nickelodeon games and the playoff game on Nickelodeon, which just grinds my gears. But I don't know how – like, that is an almost impossible question. How do you market baseball to a younger age? I, I don't know. They start putting, like, bouncy shoes, like we're playing slam ball out here for baseball. I don't know. No, you let the younger players, after they hit a double or a triple – You pause the game briefly. I know it's going to elongate the game, which is something they're trying to cut down on, but you allow them to film a TikTok live on the base, and then you (laughs) put that out. Boom. You're welcome. I solved it. Or you make every game available on Nickelodeon. You have something like ESPN, uh, the ESPN app, but it's just for baseball games or on Nickelodeon, and every game features slime. You give up, you know, a go-ahead home run right when they go for the call to the bullpen, you're slimed. And uh, they bring they bring back picture and picture. So you every time you turn on Nickelodeon, even on your TV, you can't turn off baseball. It's always in the bottom corner, and that's just where baseball lives on. Prevent tanking. Sad day. Prevent tanking by once you're eliminated from playoff contention, from base to base, each ninety feet increment you have to do a different Double Dare 2000 challenge. You have the baked Alaska to first base, you're sliding in. The next one, in order, if, if you wanna steal second, guess what, midway through first base and second base, you have to dig into a bunch of whipped cream and find the flag. And then you can proceed to second base. Sure, 
catchers probably get you more times than not, but just to spice things up. Yeah, if you want to ch- uh, charge the pitching mound, you got to climb Mount Medora or whatever that one was from <laughs> from the the challenge one. That, that show was awesome. Oh, guts the aggro crag. Guts, yeah, the aggro crag. What did you yep. call it? I was at, uh, I'm thinking of American Ninja Warrior. Sorry, Mount Mount Medora. <laughs> Mount Medora. I was like, that sounds like a deity from from some religion I'm not familiar with. But I, pr- I probably got intercepted with watching so much MLB today that that's just some old person <laughs> menopause thing that I just have got ingrained in my brain now. Well, speaking of baseball, we are very fortunate to have a special guest with us today. We'd like to. Op- Welcome on Clayton Truder, the author of Loserville Professor uh, at Norwich. Clayton, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, thanks guys for having me. I was enjoying listening to your discussion in the uh, back. It was called backstage. This is the first time I've used Streamyard, but thanks so much for having me. This, look, this is gonna be a lot of fun. So, what what did you think about our ideas for modernizing baseball? And I mean, these these again are all free. Rob Manfred is free to use them. Where do you stand? All four of them, if any double dare incorporation, I think is a fantastic idea. One thing about the advertising, I would say, in addition to the the demographic issue, those are really inexpensive ads too. That's like the bottom of the barrel marketing. Those cost like because a lot of advertising works, you you pay like a certain amount for every ten thousand viewers or something. Those things are like five, ten cents for every ten thousand viewers. So those are ads a lot. You know, it's it's like Ron Popeil, uh, you know. Um, you know, infomercial type level advertising, having that on your day to day programming. So they got they got problems in all kinds of directions with finding a finding an audience. Yeah, I shot like on my phone. I thought I was watching the Seven Hundred Club at one point as I was seeing <laughs> by. But it's in and so for for you as as a big fan of baseball and someone who is very well versed in baseball and you work within uh, the baseball realm. How are you experiencing this lockout? I'm just annoyed. I just just let's get let's get on with baseball. It seems like something that was created by the owners. Just they've manufactured a crisis for no particular reason, and it just seems to be getting worse and worse. I'm not smart enough to understand the financial particulars of the whole thing. It just it just seems like this thing that appeared out of nowhere and just gets worse and worse. And they set up these silly deadlines and and the, the golf swing thing was ridiculous too. Certainly uh, uh, with with Manfred. I yeah I mean I'm completely on the player side in this whole situation. It doesn't really seem like there's any purpose for it, and it's about the millionth example of baseball finding a way to shoot themselves in the foot and turn off the increasingly limited base that they do have. It's it is really fascinating how they can't seem to read the room, mm-hmm. the proverbial room of you see the MLB owners trying to gain public support, you see the players trying to gain public support. When, as I said, it's billionaires versus millionaires, Mm -hmm. and you're looking out with inflation as a big issue, we have an actual war going on, Mm -hmm. and we're trying to come out of the pandemic, and they're like, hey, but which side is everyone on here? And you're just thinking, you're, you're not painting yourself a very nice picture moving forward in the PR sense. I think in a strange way, the 2020 pandemic shortened season gave the owners a situation where they feel like, hey, we could do that again. We'll have a shortened season. They'll still get some money in place. We'll still keep things rolling. We'll get what we want. They saw that they could survive that. So I think from their perspective, it gives them an impetus to feel like they have leverage in bargaining the situation that fine, we'll have a short season again. The people the people shut up. They took it and they were they were glad to have baseball when they got it. Will they do that again? Who knows? But I, I think it, it created a um, a perverse incentive for them to to have that kind of situation. Yeah, and I I think what's what's interesting to me on on the PR angle is one of the first rules of PR is if you don't like what's being said, change the conversation. So if you don't want us to get into the financials about the arbitration about when guys can get into their first free agency period, about the luxury tax thresholds and all the money pieces that are really holding us up. If you just throw out there that we had an eight hour discussion today in the owner's box at Roger Dean Stadium in Jupiter, strictly about robot umps, boom. Social media is only gonna talk about the robot umps, exclusively about the robot umps. 
they can occupy themselves for the rest of these negotiations <laughs> and then they'll just come out of it with a new deal. Buy yourself some time. Yeah, I think trot out some robot umpires like it's the movie Short Circuit. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> that's that's exactly what I want. That's a great point because so many people, when they talk about robot umps, they think about it like uh, the reviews in tennis where yeah. it just is going down and saying in or out and do that with the strike zone and so forth. But no, what, what the public actually wants is what we imagine robots to be. And it's it's just like short circuit. Just wheel that one out. Johnny there. Five, Steve Gutenberg is there, uh, <laughs> Ali Sheedy. They got it all going on. So I, I really want to get to your book, Loserville. And of course, we were from Atlanta and coming um, to our listeners here from Atlanta. And it's really fascinating to me because in the book, you you not only discuss the migration of Atlanta franchises and how this came to be as a city with four professional franchises, the Expansion Falcons, uh, the Flames, when they came to Atlanta, one of two hockey franchises we've lost, but the Hawks coming from St. Louis and the Braves coming from Milwaukee. And you get into the, the racial and political um, components of the story that tell the full picture. And I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on everything that's gone on with SunTrust and now Truist Park um, about that moving from Turner Field on the southern part of Atlanta to out in the suburbs into Cobb County. Well, in many ways, it's a reflection, I think, of what a certain part of the Braves fan base and what a certain attitude within the ownership groups over time have, have thought for a long time that this is a predominantly suburban fan base and, it, and it's an extension and exaggeration of what's kind of been in place there for a while. I mean, I mean, in many ways, you had this taxing entity out there that was willing to pay for something that I think a lot of people in the Braves leadership had wanted for a long time. I, if the Olympics had not come up, I think it may well have happened in that generation because you have the confluence of events with an Olympic stadium being built with U.S. taxpayer dollars, not just Atlanta taxpayer dollars. It created a situation where it ended up getting built there. I think also if the Braves had not ended up being a dynastic team during the 90s, that move may have happened earlier on as well. Also a way to kind of separate themselves from the Falcons would would gone in with the Georgia Dome and having having their footprint downtown. It would have given the Braves a separate identity. So, so I think in many ways it's 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 not a surprising trajectory in the long term for this franchise, a franchise that has always had trouble having an odd juxtaposition between having a predominantly suburban and also a fan base that is a more of a regional fan base in many respects than one that is based particularly in the city of Atlanta. Um, so it's it's I, I guess people were it was very surprising immediately when it happened, but I think when you step back you see in many ways it's not surprising that this is what ends up happening with this franchise. So as as far as the city's passion for its teams and as I mentioned, two hockey teams come to the city, mm. two hockey teams leave for Canada. Um, but of course we still have the Hawks here, the Braves here, and the Falcons here. But it seems like the enthusiasm can be tepid at times, uh, especially depending on the winning and so forth. What what have you found from from working on this book as to why there may be some of that tepid uh, enthusiasm and support for the teams as opposed to a city like say Cleveland that is always all in on the Indians, the Guardians, Cavaliers, Browns, and the Browns' futility is well documented. The Indians now Guardians have not won a World Series since the '40s. Uh, the Cavaliers finally broke through, but before mm -hmm. that, of course, um, pretty well documented uh, decades of mediocrity. What what have you found that you would say kind of stands in the way of that? I would say at its core, Atlanta fans tend to view their pro sports franchises as they would any other consumer product. They can take it or leave it. If it's good, they'll embrace it. If not, they won't. If you look at cities like Cleveland or Chicago or cities in the north that have had teams for 100 years, your dad took you to a game and his dad took him to a game and then his dad took him to a game. Fandom there for pro sports is a multi-generational epic. The sports that have long histories in the southeast are, a little, are not their pro sports teams. I think also in a market like Atlanta that has so many transplants 
not only from the north, which people tend to focus on, but Atlanta is so much a city of transplants from across the south as well as being a major economic hub that you have people whose loyalties are elsewhere. And in some ways, I, I, I think as a result, the teams become for people something of a particular moment when they're in town, how long they're there, as opposed to something that is this very durable institutional loyalty that people develop in other places. Uh, one thing I focus on a lot in my book is that Atlantans didn't simply get interested in sports when the big leagues got to town. People had all these pre-existing sporting passions, whether it was college football with Georgia and Georgia Tech, high school football, stock car racing. The weather is fantastic in the region and allowing lots of people to participate in sports all years, all year, whether it, whether it's golf or boating or tennis. The down, people can engage in outdoor activities for a huge portion of the year relative to places in the North and Midwest. Um, a professional wrestling had an incredibly uh, vibrant uh, live audience for many years. So people had a wide range of sporting passions before the big leagues got to town. Um, combine that with all these teams getting to Atlanta so quickly. In 1965, there's no pro sports in Atlanta. By 1972, you have teams in all four major leagues. The honeymoon for these teams gets shorter and shorter over time. So it's tougher for them to get their hooks into the public as being this permanent local institution. And I think as Atlanta always had a lot of in and out of transplants throughout this year, all the way to the present, it's made it more difficult for them to become the, I guess, uh, long tenured local institutions, pro sports teams do in other towns. I think also having so many stadium changes over the year has contributed to that as well. The stadiums themselves, even if very popular when they first arrive, don't become these storied um, uh, buildings and locations the way they have in other parts of the country. Um, there's, I don't think there's a ton of nostalgia for Atlanta Fulton County Stadium or the Omni at this point, even though they've been gone for, for gone for quite a while here. Um, I'm not sure Turner Field is going to generate that in the long run. Um, I don't think Phillips Arena is probably going to develop that. People certainly love Mercedes-Benz. Um, people are enjoying uh, Truist Park and, and the Battery and all that. Who knows long term how people will view this, but it seems like every generation of leaders wants to have their own stadium, their own footprint on the metropolitan area. And, and, and it's very difficult for any of them to develop into, that's the old ball yard where my dad took me to games. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a lot of things happening simultaneously, as well as Atlanta being just such a spread out city, makes it very difficult for one particular location to become the sporting center of gravity for, for such a, a, a sprawling metropolis. Yeah, that's, that's interesting when it comes to the size, because coming from wherever you are within the Atlanta area, it's... I mean, getting from Truist to Mercedes-Benz, which is right next to mm -hmm. uh, State Farm Arena, is a Herculean task at times, depending on the time mm -hmm. of day. Whereas in a city like, say, Boston, I mean, we exclude Foxborough, which is closer to Providence than Boston. But yeah. you, can, you can walk from the Garden over to Fenway. Um, but I want to focus on... And excellent public transportation, too. I mean, you, you know, very easily well. just take the, take the tea there as well. On when it comes to the comparisons that you made in the book regarding San Diego, uh, Tampa, Phoenix, you know, as you mentioned, warmer climate cities and so forth that have fallen uh, under the same model as Atlanta. You saw the Chargers have already left San Diego. The Coyotes have threatened to leave and now are moving into, I think, a 15 seat arena. Yeah, pretty um, much. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, the, Unbelievable. the are perennially rumored to be going to, they just tried to play half their games in Montreal, whether that's mm -hmm. possible or not. Um, what do you see as far as, is is it just the transplant piece or is it is it more so the weather? Because you see uh, the Lakers don't draw unless they're winning. Uh, you <laughs> see down in Miami, the Heat draw pretty well, but it's because they're a well-run franchise. The Marlins have struggled forever um so is there is there one blame more than the other that you place in different things that you correlate between each city i think the transplant aspect of it is certainly part of it i think the weather is certainly part of it that people can engage in outdoor activities for a much longer period of the year in places across the sun belt than they can in other parts of the country i think in a place like tampa as well as phoenix an issue is that a huge percentage of the population who has moved there is on fixed incomes because many of them are retired people that they have limited discretionary income to spend on this they may watch those teams on television and actually the rays if you look at their television ratings don't do badly in their local market as far as a uh, as far as television viewership their issue is in terms of being a live draw 
So I, th I think there are particulars to those markets, but the over these these the south and uh, southwestern markets in general seem to have an overlapping uh, set of problems. I think there's also a tendency for those cities to be more sprawling than the cities of the Midwest and the Northeast as well. So they, they just developed. I mean, it wasn't like there was a city for a long time and then they started to be suburbs. Atlanta just started gr growing outward as it grew as a city itself to almost immediately. If you look at Tampa, you look at Phoenix, you find the same things. I'm not quite as familiar with San Diego, but my impression is you just end up having a sprawling of population in that respect as well. So I, I think many of these same issues are found in these different cities that all wanted to get pro sports and all explicitly uh, modeled themselves after what Atlanta did. Atlanta rolls on the red carpet, they build stadiums, they, their city and their, their their political and corporate leadership are out there saying Atlanta is open for business. They're luring pro sports in the exact same way they would have a factory or a branch plant, plant of a large corporation from a northern city. Uh, it got them teams, but once they got them, it proved a little bit more difficult than expected. I do, though, very much so in the book, try to give a pass to the city leaders, though, in terms of not foreseeing what's going to happen, because nobody had ever really done what Atlanta's leaders had done before then. They really create the model that everybody else uses. And they tried to get teams quickly because they viewed this as their shot to become a major league town. And it, 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 things have certainly gotten better over time. I mean, Atlanta's teams have drawn better. They've been very successful in recent years. But um, the initial major league generation was in many ways frustrating for both fans as well as people directly involved with the teams. I'm I'm curious. You you talked about the stadiums being linked to different uh, political leaders and so forth, mm -hmm. and we we just seemingly keep seeing stadiums pop up. Where Turner Field, built in the mid '90s, of course, mm -hmm. and then gets replaced after you know 15 plus years. And what what I'm curious about is is what your thoughts are on both the political aspects of. We, we spoke earlier in the podcast about millionaires versus billionaires and so forth. And Bill Simmons famously says, build your own damn stadium um, about using taxpayer money for such things, mm -hmm. finding what you get out of that. But also we, we see a lot of trends about that may be about to decline about how much that's actually bringing into the city as far as revenue and so forth. Because the fact of the matter is, games are getting so expensive to go to mm -hmm. and catering a lot more to business clients than they are to a family of four. And everything is not only accessible on TV, the days of, hey, we get three baseball games a week on TV are gone. You can see every game, yeah. every football game, every baseball game, every basketball game. And the experience on TV is fantastic and it's free uh with your mm -hmm. cable package as opposed to going to the stadium parking food tickets this that and the other um so i'm i'm interested to hear what you think is going to be the future of that both with building their own stadiums being on the hook for some of these uh all the money that has to be repaid there and what's what's kind of going to happen with that next evolution well, I'll start out by saying the scholarly consensus on the question of stadium building is that it's not a great driver of economic development for cities. The tendency for what they do is they may redirect some academic, uh, economic activity to a particular part of a city, such as a downtown. But pro sports is actually too small of a business, even though on the surface it appears to be a big business. It's simply too small to be a transformative force in a downtown. A Major League Baseball team, in terms of its economic activity over the course of a year, is roughly the same as one Super Walmart. And there's thousands of those around the country. So Big League Baseball collectively is a big business, but each team is individually almost like a medium-sized business in the grand scheme of things, certainly not big enough to remake a downtown. There may be a slight redistribution of economic activity as a result of it, and it may help a couple of dozen businesses right around it. Um, there's also a sense of press, bringing prestige to a city, a sense of momentum for a city, but as the actual tangible remaking of an economy, a stadium just, just doesn't do that for the downtown in any city. It, it, it's reliant on other forces uh, to, to do that. In terms of Atlanta stadiums, I, I think what happened with Mercedes-Benz Stadium, where Arthur Blank ended up footing a significant part of that bill, will end up becoming the model for it. I mean, if you compare that to Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, obviously the dollar amount is a lot more now. But in terms of percentage, Blank is, is taking care of the majority of that stadium. Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, that's entirely a property tax. 
every little homeowner in town was paying for Atlanta Fulton County Stadium in a way they aren't now. They've also gotten a lot smarter about revenue sources too, whether it's with the special taxing district in Cobb County for paying for that stadium, or it's cities that have a tax on liquor or lottery tickets or alcohol or taxes on, you know, the out-of-towner taxes on um, hotels or rental cars. Cities have become smarter about, about how they're finding revenue. So I think over time there will be a tendency towards the privatization of stadium building. I think the public also has a better sense that, 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 that just throwing a stadium up isn't, isn't a solution in the way I think they were able to convince voters at one time. I think particularly football is a tough sell just because it's in town so little of the year. We're talking eight to possibly 10, 10 dates a year. With a baseball stadium, stadium, you are talking about roughly a quarter of the days in a year. But uh, for the other sports, I think it's, it's, it's becoming a, a tougher and tougher spe- sell. And I think Atlanta is actually kind of ahead of the curve on that. Um, when Kasim Reed was mayor, he actually was quite clear about this, that like the thrashers were like, hey, l- why don't you build us a stadium? He's like, my constituents don't follow the thrashers. We're not going to spend money to build a stadium to keep the thrashers in town. If somebody in one of the suburban counties wants to do the city of Atlanta, Fulton County is not paying for a new hockey arena to keep you in town. And they end up leaving. I, I really admire the pragmatism of uh, uh, that he brought to that issue. Yeah, that's they always say when it comes to negotiation, you have to be prepared to lose <laughs> if you're going to get into negotiating. And the Thrashers, you know, they played that hand of, hey, we want a stadium. And sure enough, the city of Atlanta didn't really care about the Thrashers enough to keep them. And you know who does want a hockey team? Everyone in Canada. So that's that right. Was fine. Um, so in in the book, you discuss, of course, that that time period, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and so forth. And Atlanta was, as a city outside of sports, changing so dramatically during that time. Of course, the country was changing, but the city of Atlanta in particular had some really interesting shifts. How did you find the parallels between these franchises moving to Atlanta, the growth of Atlanta, and a lot of the racial and socioeconomic changes within the city? Well, I think the most important thing I did was just go through day by day in the newspapers. I looked at every single day of every single newspaper for the the Journal, the Constitution, the Daily World, the major Atlanta papers. Um, I, I just went day by day throughout the 60s and 70s. And by seeing these events juxtaposed with each other, I think it makes the trends a little clearer, the relationships among these things, whether it's merely a correlation or whether it's actually a t- causation. You see these ideas happening um, in relationship to each other. That people aren't, for example, people aren't embracing coming to downtown Atlanta to go to the games. That's happening at the same time that people are are trying to prevent public housing from moving to suburban Atlanta. They're trying to avoid mass transit from connecting suburbs to cities. There was clearly a suburban impulse to try to avoid direct connections with the city of Atlanta in this time period. And I think sports in many ways suffered from some of these social trends that were happening. So I think a lot of the things that are happening simultaneously, even if not directly related, are a product of some of the same ideas that are going through people's heads in these particular time periods. As far as, of course, when it comes to writing and long form writing, uh, of course, that you, you go in with a plan, you go in with an outline and you go in thinking about where you're going to go and where you're going to get to. What was the biggest, I'm not sure about wrench, but maybe surprise that you came across as you were researching, as you were building out the book? In terms of the actual history of the city, I had read pretty much by the, t- by the time I got going on it, I'd read pretty much every history of the city. So I had a kind of a sense of the narrative of what was going to happen just in terms of the city, politically, economically, culturally in the time period. I would say the biggest surprise to me was actually the flames, the degree of support they received locally in their tenure in town. I would was kind of perceived as a complete outsider, the flames as being kind of a joke. Oh, they were this silly team and they didn't like hockey, blah, blah, blah. The Flames drew above average attendance in the majority of their seasons. They made the playoffs in six of their eight years in town. For several years, they were the go-to night out, or at least the starting point of the go-to night out for a lot of affluent Northsiders in the, in the, in the early to mid-1970s. In the heyday of underground Atlanta, thousands of people started their night going to a Flames game before going to a club or a bar or something like that at underground Atlanta afterwards because they were just basically right next to each other. 
Um, so the Flames really drew very enthusiastic support in their in their early years in town. And their departure had as much to do with Tom Cousins' real estate empire downtown falling apart as it did anything in terms of the team's actual success. He couldn't find a local buyer. As you say, there were plenty of people in Canada who wanted a team. There were a couple of new, newly rich oil men in Alberta who were willing to give him more than two and a half times what he paid for the team initially. And um, that uh, that was the story of the Flames. It had it really had less to do with the actual popularity and success of the team. I enjoyed. I you know I did I did quite a few interviews for the book. I talked to some former Flames. That was really great to get a sense of those guys' reaction. Who generally, particularly Bill Clement, who became a very prominent announcer on ESPN. Lo- just loved living in Atlanta. Maintained a residence there for many years. Thought it was thought Atl- Atlanta was heaven on earth compared to what he was used to. I mean, coming from Philadelphia, I kind of understand. I but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, he he got nothing but singing Atlanta's praises. Um, how how do you feel? And there's there's a monster disconnect as always between folks who truly understand the economics of running a baseball team and what the fans want and so forth. And Mm -hmm. David Sampson, former president of the Marlins, uh, who we had on this podcast maybe a year or so ago, um, he recently said that the math has changed in baseball, that when the Marlins pursued Albert Pujols, they said, "We'll, we'll have him for 10 years, but we're essentially going to build it out to where we're paying him for eight. Um, so that they knew that he was going to be valuable for X amount of years, but he's still going to be on the books for this long. So if you're paying a guy three years, 9 million, essentially in your head, you're saying, all right, we're paying him two years, four and a half million a year. Then that third year where we think he's going to regress is sort of a throw in where that math has completely changed. How are you viewing the immensely complicated relationship right now with the Braves and Freddie Freeman? where he's incredibly popular in the city, just brought the, the Braves their first World Series championship since the mid-90s. Um, but he's getting up there in age. And if he wants a long-term deal, of course, you're saying, hey, this first baseman, when he's 38, 39, what are we getting out of this? And the Braves, to make matters even more complex, and what's thrown a wrench into the negotiation process, is being owned by not just one billionaire, about having shareholders mm-hmm. that they have to uh, uh, adhere to. So what what's sort of your thought on how that's all playing out and so forth? What's your take on that? I, I think in the end it's going to be very difficult to not respond to the fan base. I think the, the fans will certainly punish them. This guy who's become the big hero in town, not, making, not, not having him wear a Braves uniform for at least a certain number of years after that championship. I think for many people who may not have been, gone to a game last year, Part of it is simply having the opportunity to go honor and celebrate that guy who ended up playing a prominent role in their lives in terms of bringing the very rare championship to town. So I, I think to some extent there's 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 almost an owing it to to him for what he meant to the franchise for those particular fans. It's, there's a sort of catharsis to it, I think, um, for, for fans. I mean, being growing up in New England, being a Red Sox fan, I saw that with the championships. They've won in recent decades. There are guys they kept around too long. And I think as much as anything, it's like there's people in New Hampshire who are like, well, we get down to one game a year. This is our chance to go see whoever it is who they hung on a little, you know, Kevin Millar or whoever who hung on a little, a little, <laughs> little, a little too long. But I, I mean, I think people are very earnest about this kind of stuff that the, the, the people that winning a championship is so implanted in people's memory. There's so much emotion associated with it. For a t- I think the Braves in some ways have a similar f- kind of regional fan base to the Red Sox and that they draw people from very far away who are Braves fans. And that's in part because of TBS. But even before that, they are before there's any other teams in the region, they basically have seven states around them that are Braves country. And to mm-hmm. this day, have significant fan bases all around them. And, and that's much like the Red Sox having the six New England states, I think, that there's people who may get one chance a year to come to the games from the sort of hinterlands of the region. And, and and I think I think there's a there's a value to that 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 can't be underestimated. Absolutely. And as far as as what you've seen and what you've read and from people that you've talked to when it comes to the city of Atlanta, I think it's it's interesting when it is pro sports about if it's winning that draws. For instance, you know the the Red Sox are always going to draw. Mm-hmm. Always going to draw the the Guardians in Cleveland. They'll 
they'll draw even if they call it the mistake by the lake and so forth. Um, but then winners, Miami, you have to win for us to go. L.A., you have to win for us to go. You have to prove to us that you're worth seeing there. Or there's a third faction where it's a social piece. Now, where, where do you find that Atlanta pro sports fans typically end up within that sort of spectrum? Or if they're in some sort of Dr. Frankenstein uh, hybrid there of a Venn diagram, um, where it, are people going to Braves games because they're winning? Are people going because, hey, it's July, it's warm, let's go get some beers, let's have some good food, we'll get some friends, we'll have a good time in the upper deck at the Braves game? Where, where do you see Atlanta explicitly falling in there? I think they're cl a little bit closer now to the team being a cherished institution regionally than I, I think in earlier generations it was probably closer to LA and Miami. But I think over time, as the team has been in town, there are plenty of people now who are old enough, they're bringing their kids to the games, their parents had brought them to the games, that they have this, this long tenure regional association now. I think TBS broadcasting every game basically before anybody else did, also created that too, that it was just part of the rhythm of summer for people to watch the Braves, to follow, even if they're only watching a couple innings each night, that it's just the part of the way you end your day. So I, I think the Braves have over time developed a, a situation closer to that. Even though attendance has waxed and waned at different times, I think as being a broader regional attraction, the Braves do maintain that, and, and, and they're probably the most... Um, I guess, solid civic institution among the pro teams in Atlanta at this point. I mean, the Falcons support seems to seems to go up and down a bit. Certainly the Hawks has had that issue. Things are hot for Atlanta United now. Who knows how long that's going to last in the future. Hopefully they continue to be successful. I mean, I mean, one, one thing that's of great interest to me is that Atlanta really was quietly a very good soccer market for a long time. They'd had a team back in the 60s with the Atlanta Chiefs who were one of the more successful NASL teams and in terms of, as a participatory event, uh, youth soccer had been incredibly popular in suburban Atlanta. I think as popular as anywhere. You get a team, it's this place for all these people to place their affections, and they, as well as many, 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 many people from immigrant communities in Atlanta, it became a great location for a lot of people to come together, and 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 it became their team. And it's very exciting to see the team's success as well as the great support they've received in recent years. Now. We'll get you out of here on this. Really interested to hear your your take on this, and you just touched on the Hawks. But the Braves, as you mentioned, a regional institution. And there is sort mm -hmm. of that cat in the cradle relationship with baseball in America anyway. Uh, hey, I you see the signs at Braves games. We drove from Charlotte to see the Braves play. And folks in South Carolina and North Carolina and Tennessee – Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Braves fans. And, of course, Florida didn't have Major League Baseball teams until yeah. the 90s. And so they were – you still have, a, particularly on the panhandle, Jacksonville, so forth, a lot of Braves fans there. Uh, the Falcons, the NFL is just kind of a different monster these days. But when it comes to the Hawks, there, there seems to be uh, a little bit less of an attachment to the Hawks despite them being here for – decades upon decades as opposed to the i mean the celtics you're obviously they're never ever leaving yeah. boston um and the lakers have a tie to la the bulls have such a tie to chicago and so forth but as many braves car decals as you see and falcons car decals as you see you don't terribly see a ton of hawks uh on 485 285 75 um so do you think that the hawks that Atlanta's in any sort of peril about losing the Hawks due to a lack of attachment, a lack of relationship intrinsically linked in the city? No, I, I don't really think so. I think there's a couple of factors at play. I mean, the Hawks have had a bunch of different ownership groups at this point. Over 50 years, I guess, five different ownership groups. And by not having a steady group that's in there this whole really long period of time, I think it's made it a little bit difficult for them to become so central to the city's culture. I think secondly, also, it's the nature of the NBA, too. It's such a star-driven enterprise. I mean, certainly with Trey Young, now they have one of the league's bright young stars. But the, the league is very reliant on those guys as their attractions. Even in Boston, I went to a bunch of Celtics games when I used to live there. There were plenty of people who were there 
people were going to see whatever the star on the other team was. And it didn't have to be LeBron James or somebody. It could have been a very secondary guy. I remember one time there were a bunch of, there were like five guys sitting in front of me all wearing, um, who was it? Uh, uh, Joachim Noah jerseys. Like there, this is a group of guys who, they were really into him for whatever reason. Like he was, he had come out and he was, he was uh, like doing his pregame shoot around and these guys were just going nuts for him. Um, so I, I think the NBA is so much so 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 personality based it seems, and and I think their social media presence has also contributed to that. That a lot of their success in recent years is because there's almost been almost like a pro wrestling quality to I think the way the league has presented itself a little bit, which is great. I love I, I'm enjoying thoroughly. I'm a big NBA fan and follow that way too closely on social media. But it it seems that it's less about team ties than it is ties to particular players. So I, I don't know how much of an outlier I'm not an expert, but I don't know how much of an outlier Atlanta is in that in that sense. But I, I don't have any particular worries on on that in terms of the the future of the franchise. I mean, in terms of performance, you know, it's certainly been up and down this year. But I mean, they they have one of the league's great stars at this point, and I think it'll be an attraction for years to come. I'm very very troubled by the story of a bunch of guys going explicitly to see Joaquin Noah. Maybe That's, they're Florida grads. I don't know. I mean, are are they quarry guys from Charlestown? Are they warehouse guys from Worcester? I mean, that's a blue collar guy to go support. That's not that's not your job, Morant high flying. That's that's I'm a not really guy. That's a good question. I, I you know, and if I if I went back, I would love to just interview those guys and have probably do a whole separate book on Noah about that. Um, yeah, he, he was putting a lot of time. No, Noah was. They must have known something because Noah spent a lot of time working on his shot before the game. Doesn't seem to have worked, but he was certainly spending a tremendous amount of time just working on his kind of mid-range jumpers in preparation for this game, which they ended up getting uh, pounded in. That's that's something that I'm going to be thinking about for some time, <laughs> and it is a mystery that's going to live deep within my head. Um, but Clayton, we really enjoyed having you on. Uh, it, was, it was really terrific talking about the book and, and hearing your insight into all this. Uh, for anyone who wants to go out, I really, really encourage you to go out and get Loserville, How Professional Sports Remade Atlanta and How Atlanta Remade Professional Sports. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, really anywhere that books can be found, right? Well, check this out. I just sent you a promo code that any of your listeners can get 40% off the cover price by buying it directly from the publisher, the University of Nebraska Press. Um, if you put in that promo card SAF21, you go to their website, it's going to be a lot cheaper than it is on Amazon. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to include that for everyone, for them to be able to use. That's fantastic. Well, Thank like, you guys so much. I, I love the Norway 94 shirt. That's my favorite Olympics by far. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that was my, I had to wear That was the I year I really got it. into it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I, yeah I, I, I just love the Lilyhammer games. My favorite of all time. Not not a Lake Placid guy? Well, I was I was, I was, was not born for another year. So, like, in retrospect, <laughs> I love the idea of Lake Placid. And I would hope they get it again. But I just think uh, it's uh, – it's 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 like it's like being like oh my favorite player is Warren Spawn like I sort of feel like your favorite player should be a guy that you saw play games live as opposed to someone you saw in a documentary on Sports Century kind of thing I mean you can appreciate these guys from the past but it's odd if you never cheered for them in an actually competing game that I I always always call BS on the people who say oh who is your inspiration you'll see like a like at someone the age of Timothy Chalamet. It's, oh, big Marlon Brando guy. Like, come <laughs> on. You didn't grow up watching Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando shows were in the in the movie theater when you were growing up. Or like you said, like an athlete, like if Tiger Woods said that his favorite golfer was Sam Snead. No, it wasn't. Come on. <laughs> the Be kid real. who was next to me in my senior yearbook in high school, he wrote something about how uh, if I if I had a time machine, I would have it go back to the fifties so I could hear Johnny Most call the Celtics games. Was it? I mean, I feel like there's a lot of ways one could use a time machine. I I mean, I guess I'm not opposed to it, but it seems like a very odd, very specific choice. Yeah, I don't think the guy who invents the time machine goes, "All right, we have enough juice for one. What are you gonna do? I want to I want to go hear Johnny Most call games. All right, have the check has stolen the ball. You know. <laughs> Was I had no idea you went to high school with Bob Ryan. That's amazing. Apparently, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, 
Well, that's fantastic. We're going to get that promo code out to everybody. Clayton, thank you so much again. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thank you guys so much for having me on. All right. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks, as always, for listening. And thanks again to Clayton. We'll get that promo code out to everybody and make sure that everyone has that. Uh, thanks, as always, to Cut Bet. Uh, Doc, you're a big proponent of Cut Bet, aren't you? Absolutely. Cut out the big. Absolutely. Cut out the VIG. A lot of exciting stuff going on with Cut. If you want to join the Cut Wave, shoot them a DM on Twitter or Instagram, and they will get you going. They are in beta. They are moving. They are moving. You can find them at Cut Bet on Twitter or Instagram, K-U-T-T. You can find us at SJB Atlanta on Twitter, at Spaghetti Junction Boys on Instagram. If you prefer to see our beautiful shining faces as opposed to the leathery tones of our voices go check us out on youtube we have a youtube page now doc has those going every week for you thanks as always for listening and we'll see you next week